Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Redefined Horizons, and this is the first video in a set of videos we're doing for our Spring 2020 Land Title webinar series. So this is part one, the first video, and we're going to answer this question, why is it hard to identify land? And this is an important question because it helps you, the answer to this question helps you understand why we have land title insurance, why we have a, a recording system, and why we have land surveyors, what their role is in the real property system, the boundary surveyor's role. And it'll also explain a little bit about the, the overlap between land title and, and boundary surveying. And so the first thing I want to do in this video, and we'll try and keep these short, try and keep them 10 minutes or less. The first thing I want to do is explain why this question is important. So why is it important that we're able to identify land? And the basic reason is the, the ability to uniquely identify land is kind of the, the cornerstone or, or one of the foundation stones to our real property system here in the United States. And so we have a, a system usually involves recording of, of transactions related to real property. And one of the key pieces of information in that system is the piece of land that's being bought or sold or otherwise encumbered. Okay. And so you need to be able to tell one piece of land or one parcel of property from another parcel. And so that's hard to do. And that's part of the reason why we've developed this system that we have that involves boundary surveyors and uh, written descriptions of land. We'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a couple minutes. So let's talk for a minute about the three really important questions that have to do with this topic, kind of related to the identification of land. <clears throat> and these three questions are part of that system that we've developed in the United States, the legal system that we've developed to track who owns land and what land they own. Okay, and I we call that a cadastral system. I've got some other videos, uh, some other videos that we'll try and link to in the description that talk more about that. But let's go ahead and look at those three questions and talk a little bit about how boundary surveying and land title overlap. Okay, so I'm going to draw a, little, a Venn diagram here. So we've got two circles. Okay, we're going to have a pink circle and a purple circle. Okay. This pink circle over here is where? The question where. So where is the land? Where are the boundaries of a particular piece of property? And over here, this, this question is who? Who owns the land? Okay. Who, who is either the fee owner, and I'll, we'll explain that term in another video. In other words, who is the actual owner of the land? And also, who, own, who has an interest in the land? And we'll, we'll explain what an interest is, but you, know, who has, you can sell individual rights to land. That's called an interest. So who owns the actual dirt? And who else might have an interest in the property? Okay, so that's who. Where, and then we have this question in the middle, okay, which is what? What is the land? Okay, is it lot 20 of block 15 of some map? Is it the north 300 feet of the southwest quarter of the southwest quarter of some section? What is it? Okay, so who owns it? What is it? And where is it on the ground? Those are the three things the three kind of sub-questions that are related to this question, why is it hard to identify land? Now, on this Venn diagram over here, we can basically draw, we'll put some little AutoCAD style dimensions, okay? This right here, this area, is handled by land title professionals, okay? It could be lawyers, land attorneys, it could also be uh, folks that work in the land title industry. So they're concerned about who, and to some extent, what. Who owns what. Okay. And then we'll draw another AutoCAD style dimension over here. Okay. And this is uh, this group of bozos over here. These are land surveyors, <laughs> of which I am one. That's why I can make fun of them. Okay. And we're concerned about what what is the land, and where is it on the ground. Okay. And there's some overlap. Right, so there's some title folks and surveyors overlap sometimes. We work together quite frequently. Okay, and if you're doing some kind of real estate transaction or development, real estate development, you need both of these. You need a good land surveyor and you need a good 
you need a good title company, you need a good title officer. Okay? So these three questions, who owns it, what is it, and where is it at on the ground? Okay, those are important questions that our real property system or our cadastral system in the United States needs to answer. And they're related to this question of why is it hard to identify land. So really this this what is it question and the why is it hard to identify land, those are the same issue in essence, right? What is it? You can't answer what it is if you can't identify the piece of the piece of property you're talking about, right? So we need to be able to uniquely identify a piece of property to be able to answer this question. What is what is the property that's being bought or sold? Right? Okay, so in order to understand why it's hard to do that, why it's hard to identify land, I'm going to put another diagram up. Okay. So we're going to talk about the differences between real property or real estate and personal property for a couple minutes. And I don't want to I don't want to get too legalistic with this. This is kind of an informal definition, but understanding the differences between real and personal property will help you understand why it's hard to identify land. So I'm just going to draw a little T-shaped diagram here that will allow us to contrast these two things. Okay. And like I said, there's legal definitions of both these things, and there's something that's in between real estate and personal property called fixtures. We're not getting into that. I'm trying to keep this fairly basic. Okay, so over here we're going to put real estate or real property. And over here we're going to put personal property, and then we'll talk about how those are different. And you're going to see the contrast here. Okay, so here's my first difference. I'll look at my notes so I don't forget. Personal property is typically portable. That means you can move it from one place to another, right? So I'm going to borrow my partner's coffee cup mug. This is a piece of personal property. It belongs to my partner, Danny. This is portable. I can take this and move it around, right? So personal property is portable. Real estate is not portable <laughs> as a general rule. Okay, so it's not portable. Okay, it's what we call fixed. In other words, you can't move it. In fact, one of the, the legal tests to help determine whether something is real estate or personal property is whether or not it's fixed to the land and how permanently it is fixed to the land. Okay, so that's one difference. Another important difference is uh, real property is distinct. One piece of real property is distinct from another. Okay, and then I, I, I just use another term here that helps us understand that. So I'm going to say it's easily separable. Separatable. I probably won't spell that right. So forgive my spelling. So you go back to the coffee mug. This mug is distinct from another mug, right? It's also distinct from this box of Kleenex, which is another piece of personal property. You're not going to confuse these, these two as a general rule. They're separate physical objects, right? You, they can be separated easily into their respective things. Okay? So they're distinct, they're easily separatable. Okay, real estate is not distinct. It's continuous or connected. So you can't physically separate one piece of real estate from another piece, right? They're, they're connected together. And real estate itself is continuous across the surface of the earth, right? Okay, so that's something that, that makes real estate harder to identify. And then finally, just kind of to sum this up, right? Personal property is easier to identify. And real estate is hard to identify. And I want to talk about why I use this word easier and not easy. Personal property is still not easy to identify, but it's easier than land as a general rule. So personal property, you know, if I own this, this is my book here, and it is Land Development Handbook. I could open this up and put my name in it, right? I could say owned by Landon Blake. Okay, so I've identified my ownership there, right? But there's lots of books that were printed with this title and even with this same 
ISBN number, right? So it's it's a little bit of a challenge to uniquely identify this as mine, but I can attempt that. I can put my name in it. But it's not always as clear cut as it seems, right? Because one thing I do occasionally is I will buy used books, and sometimes used books come with the name with the name of a different person in it, right? So what do I do there? Do I cross it out with a sharpie? Do I tear that page out? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the system doesn't work perfect. Okay, we do the same thing. You know, we attempt to do the same thing with automobiles, right? So we stamp a VIN number on an automobile. I have a friend of mine that works for a company in, here in California. All they do is make little metal tags that allow companies to stamp their name and an ID number on valuable physical assets, okay, personal property. So we attempt to do that. We attempt to identify it. Uh, but it's not easy. It's tricky. Land's even harder to identify, right? How do you uniquely identify a piece of land? Like, you know, do you... Do you stamp the owner name and address in, in a concrete block? You know, you put it, you stamp it in the sidewalk. Uh, you know, you put a, you put a sign up in the front yard. It's just tricky. It's tricky to identify land. Okay. So these are some of the reasons why it's hard. Okay. Land's not portable. It's fixed. It's continuous and connected, right? So it's not, it's hard to tell one piece of land apart from another piece of land. And it's hard to identify. So what have we done to to solve this problem attempted to do in the United States. Okay, well, we gave these guys a job, these surveyors a job, okay? So land surveyors prepare written descriptions to uniquely identify land. Okay, now a lot of people call those legal descriptions. I like to call them land descriptions. I think it's a better term. Okay, but it's actually a written description that identifies a piece of property. And, you know, we typically will include a plat or a map there, so there's a graphical component too, but there's a written component, a graphical component. But one of the things that land surveyors are supposed to be able to do is really important is that when they write a description of a piece of property that it can only identify one piece of land. If you can possibly identify two pieces of land, or if, there, if, if two land descriptions could overlap, then the surveyor hasn't done his job. And in fact, that's one of the things the courts will do to determine if a land description is valid, is does it uniquely identify a piece of land. So one of the big roles that land surveyors have in the United States real property system, the cadastral system, is this role of preparing written descriptions of land. And when people prepare descriptions of land and they haven't been trained to do that properly, it causes a lot of problems causes boundary problems and land title problems. And so an example of this in, in California, utility companies can prepare their own land descriptions for their easements and uh, they don't have to have a licensed surveyor in charge of that process. And utility easements in California are notoriously hard to put on the ground uh, for that very reason. Okay, so just to wrap the video up, I want to do a quick example of, a, of something that came up on a survey I was doing in San Francisco. And I was working on a land title survey, and there was a document <clears throat> that uh, had had to do with some restrictions that the city had put on this particular piece of property. And the property was a corner of a block, so it looked something like this. Okay. So, I don't know, 30 years ago, the city came in, and they, there was a document that encumbered this particular parcel with some restrictions in addition to the zoning. It was part of some agreement with the developer. And they didn't include a legal description of the property, probably because they didn't know what they were doing or they didn't think it was necessary. But you're going to see how that caused a problem. So instead they just referenced an address. Okay. I'm just going to make an address up. So they said, uh, the actual legal document that imposed the restriction said 500 Marina Street. So these these restrictions apply to 500 Marina Street. And that was the Exhibit A, just typically the land description to something like that. Okay. So the title company wanted to know, they wanted me to certify on my map that these restrictions apply to this property. Now here was the problem I had with that. And we worked out a solution, but the problem was at some point that the owner here sold to a developer and the developer went in and they put on a couple buildings and these are multi-story condo buildings. 
or apartments, I can't remember. And so this address no longer existed, 500 Marina Street. And there wasn't just one address now, there was, there was 40 addresses, right? And the addresses didn't even use the same street anymore. This is Marina. Okay. This is Mount Diablo Avenue. Now all the addresses reference Mount Diablo Avenue because that's what the developer wanted. He didn't like Marina, I guess, for some reason. And so here's what I told the title company. I said, look, here's what I can say on my survey. I can say on my survey that this particular document referenced an address that used to be assigned to this parcel at some point in the past, and that's all I can say. I said, how do I know how this document applies to what we have now? This address no longer exists. I said, does it apply? Does this document apply to the whole parcel? Does it apply to one building? Does it apply to both buildings? Does it apply to just the common areas? I mean, there's a legal question there that I can't answer, right? Because somebody didn't do this right. You know, an address could refer to a building, it could refer to a room in a building, or it can refer to the whole parcel of land. So this is what happens when surveyors aren't involved in our system in the United States with the description of real property. You can't just throw an address on something, right? That creates confusion. And so that's why it's just hard. It's hard to identify land. That's part of the reason why land surveyors have a role in our real property system. And that's part of the reason why title professionals and surveyors work together so, so often is you know, title companies are concerned about who owns it and what it is. And surveyors are concerned about what it is and where it's at and the what what is the land that's being bought or sold you know that that's all about identification what is this unique piece of land that's being transferred okay so i hope i hope that helps it's a good introduction to our webinar series and i hope you get, we catch you on uh, video number two we'll talk about this some more